I was really excited to be invited to speak here today. And after I saw the agenda, I started to realize that it was very heavy on climate change. And what uh, we've been working on, what I'm presenting, um, while it isn't focused in, or it's not in response solely to climate change, climate change does play a factor into why uh, there was a need for this uh, landscape assessment as it's uh, increasing the uh, ability of the beetle to reproduce much more quickly, uh, leading to us have to being able to detect, detect it on a much earlier basis. So uh, just quickly run through a slight background, provides information for the rest of the uh, presentation. Uh, Asian old horn beetle uh, in Massachusetts is not the first. It actually was uh, established in New York and since then has been found in several locations. Fortunately, it has been eradicated in a few of those, including Boston. Uh, you still have active infestations here in Massachusetts, the one in Worcester. Uh, you have the one in New York, which hopefully in a few years will be declared eradicated after a few decades, and the Ohio infestation. And knowing how many times it's been introduced and uh, knowing how prominent uh, its host trees are uh, in New England or in North America, and as Melody had said, that ALB could survive in much of the U.S., I, I don't believe it to be far-fetched that we would see another introduction in the future. And that is not the agency's you know, official statement, but mine, so disclaimer. And uh, as I said, the host trees, uh, 12 different genera, but uh, what we've observed uh, historically, maple, elm, birch, and willow are what they prefer. And out of the trees found infested on our program, you can see Norway maple and red maple and uh, to a lesser extent sugar maple, and I think that's based on distribution. Are, are the ones that were found to be infested. And just a snapshot of the damage, because I always like to include that. Some egg sites there. And the extent of what the damage, uh, damage that the beetle can do. That was a tree actually in New Jersey, but we have seen the equivalent here in Massachusetts early on in the program. That tree had 800 exit holes, was pretty much completely dead, and was dated to have only been infested for seven years. And this is the uh, scenario we're dealing with in Massachusetts. And what we're trying to avoid in the future is you have uh, complete uh, devastation of the landscape uh, when, well, the monoculture of Norway maple trees in that area didn't help. But uh, when left to its own devices, uh, it can uh, drastically change the landscape. And uh, I'd like to throw in that now picture because we have done uh, an extensive replanting program in cooperation with the state and the city which is always nice to see. And this is an overview of our 110 square mile regulated area. Uh, and those points up there are all the infested trees. Uh, this is actually 2016's map, and I forgot to include 2017's. Though, fortunately, we've only detected 54 additional infested trees so far in 2017. So that wouldn't change this map too drastically. And uh, last bit of information. Uh, we, after approximately seven years, we reached a limitation, meaning we surveyed the entirety of what we had to survey uh, a mile and a half out from any infested tree back uh, late 2014, early 2015, and now our secondary surveys are underway, and that what, that's what led to the, uh, the creation of this, this dispersion model, or yeah, dispersion model and landscape risk assessment, and as you can see there, there's quite a few uh, infested trees removed uh, along with high risk. And we conducted full host uh, removal operations on approximately 1,600 acres. And those, that, those areas where we conducted that removal, uh, host density varied from 5% to 95%, depending on the landscape. And again, a breakdown of when we found most of those infested trees early on in the program, obviously. And I want to include this in the slide or to the presentation because it speaks to how when a infestation is detected, it's, uh, it's very reactive and it's a little bit of a hopscotch around you know, that, that infested area. And your response uh, initially, it kind of has to go that way. But there's an opportunity once you establish your regulated area and reach the limitation to reapproach it in a more scientific manner. 
And so before diving into the uh, explanation of the model, uh, just again to give to catch up on the background, when an infestation of ALB is established, uh, the plan is to survey a mile and a half of any known infested tree, which that does work. It's proven effective. We have eradicated it before. But to after reaching the limitation, knowing that it took us seven years to get to that point, and knowing that we left these original infested areas uh, unsurveyed for seven years, uh, I feel like uh, that's 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 not proper, and that's a that's a that's not, that's not going to lead to success, uh, or it's actually going to extend the length of the program because you're allowing too much time for that insect to spread. Um, just really a desire to be less reactive and more. Uh, proactive and decision-making from a scientific basis. So here what we have is uh, the dispersion model and an example that I have pointed out is, this is our code for designating certain areas. Boy 917 is actually the town of Boylston in zone nine and a subset of that is uh, unit 17. And there were 60 exit holes found in this uh, clump of infested trees. And uh, the data that uh, well, the basis of the model, after reviewing all current published data as well as our own data, and there's going to be some other uh, papers coming out based on this work, I think relatively soon, um, from Dr. Talbot Trotter with the U.S. Forest Service out of Connecticut, um, you have to assume one beetle for every 20 exit holes that are on that tree. And we feel that's a conservative estimate, and that's the way we're always going to go with this type of modeling. Uh, we'd rather be uh, cautious than, than not. And um, again, I wanted to throw this slide in here uh, to speak to, and I should have probably put it before, how reactive you have to be initially. So these are the service calls coming in from the public. These are people that, oh, oh my God, ALB's here, what are we gonna do? So early on, we, uh, ALB was found in late 2008, 2009. You have 2000 2000 calls. In 2010, we were all over the place. One day you're surveying here, for a couple of hours, you get another call that somebody has an infested tree, uh, they have a beetle in a jar, you know, their kid's playing with one, putting it in their mouth or something, you know? <laughs> so you're, you're driving over there, and uh, that's actually how the first one was found, the woman's grandchildren <laughs> playing with it. So, um, but uh, yeah, so it, it's, 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 a, it's a bit of a crapshoot to begin with. And so uh, on the right, you're going to see the raster model developed from uh, some of the factors and the inputs that we included into this model. And uh, uh, a lot of it's uh, natural dispersion, uh, wind direction and wind frequency. We have a prevailing northeast wind. That doesn't come into play in those short scale infestations, probably within 250 meters of that initial tree. But what we find is that they uh, will take flight and in certain areas they can uh, the, the wind, it does seem, uh, we do assume that it does play a factor. And uh, I'll show another slide later where uh, we speak to how the infestation, the oldest infestation was actually at the very tree top uh, in the canopy layer. Uh, also distance from firewood operations as, as, far, as well as uh, wooden storage facilities, distance from major highways as there's reason to, uh, reason to believe from what we've observed that, that it could have been distributed along these highways because we have found it on highway medians uh, far away from other or reasonable distance from other infestations, as well as density of infested trees and host tree density. And so we took this uh, raster model and what we come up with in practice or to use is uh, something like this. The light green represents what we've accomplished for our secondary surveys after reaching the limitation. So this is through 2016 and 2017. We've surveyed everything in green. What you see highlighted in purple, which what was, uh, this was what was identified as priority areas from this model. And uh, in going back and surveying these areas, we did find infested trees. But before we go on from that, before we get on a little bit further, I want this is what 2018's model is looking like and is in the works. Another very rough draft, but you can see the areas that have already been surveyed in the previous year uh, come out as uh, lower priority, while the core area is now coming back up as somewhere where we need to get into. Another overall layer to this whole dispersion model is that we have established that we don't want to let any place that has had known infested trees 
sit there for longer than four years. Four years being that uh, three years we feel is the longest time that it's going to take for the beetle to complete a complete life cycle. And uh, after three years, we feel that if it wasn't, uh, if we couldn't see it from the ground at that point, maybe it's made itself apparent then. But any time longer than four years, which unfortunately we had, as I mentioned before, we see that the spread can uh, actually be quite severe. And this is a very rough draft of 2019's model. Um, everything else has been grayed out. And these still show up as low priority right now because the completion date for survey hasn't been input into the model yet. Once that is uh, input into the model, those will show up as a uh, much higher priority to get into. And uh, a zoom in of that Boylston Zone 9 Unit 17 that had been mentioned before, uh, you see here three different clusters of infestation. And these are the ones where this is on the left right here was stated to be the oldest, uh, second oldest, and the youngest. And you can see that those 200 meter raster grids uh, show pretty much or emphasize the priority to get into there, or at least the greatest, uh, the greatest chance of encountering a beetle. So this model isn't necessarily predictive as to where the beetle is going to go, but where the chances of uh, encountering that beetle. So next slide. Here we've applied uh, our standard buffers. And um, this has always been a practice. We apply a buffer, we go out and we survey it. But instead of going and surveying the complete 1.5 miles from that source tree, we're able to now better manage our staff and our resources to reach a set confidence level. Rather than just saying, yeah, we're going to survey a mile and a half, we're going to say, well, we want to reach a confidence level of 90% uh, or greater than 10% chance of encountering the beetle. And even within that, we can say that we'll dedicate our climbing or aerial surveyors. We have teams of uh, specialized skilled climbers that can survey the trees more thoroughly. They can be focused in and around this area where then you assign, assign your ground survey crews to these outer buffers. And so, and so you, now you avoid uh, over committing your staff to certain areas where they're going to be going on and surveying for months on end. Um, so therefore, uh, once you reach that confidence level, you're able then to move them on to a different area, thus uh, decreasing the time and actually detecting further infestations earlier, earlier detection, and and uh, just becoming and just being a little bit more efficient with the work that we're doing, um, and also the other buffer wasn't included in here. But this infestation right here, it would have been captured by what the model had uh, projected, or at least uh, the buffers that come from that model. And this is the original raster that we've raster map that we've been looking at, um, and this is still in development. Uh, we are in version 1.0. Uh, this is hopefully version 2.0 using 40 meter uh, rasters. And uh, the ultimate goal is to have this not only utilized in Massachusetts, but uh, looking at working with the Ohio program, as well as possibly the New York program, and any future program going forward. So right now, it's only applied to our small microcosm in Massachusetts. But on a larger scale, uh, we feel that this could enable more efficiency and for quicker eradication for uh, current infestations, and hopefully not, but possible future ones. And uh, a couple of points I wanted to make on that one, and I'm sorry I had to refer to my notes, but uh, really it's, it's a combination of just being more efficient, but also what I found in experience is uh, early detection is a factor of public participation. We all say citizen scientists, and uh, out of all the talks I've done uh, I, early on, you, you, you talked about the mile and a half survey, whatnot, people, they ask a lot of questions. The more I talk about the science, the more I talk about how involved uh, we are in uh, analyzing this stuff, the more trust we've, and uh, confidence we've received from uh, the public. 
And in turn, we've received uh, many more phone calls and much more cooperation and people still calling, which, you know, there's, of course, there's a lot of uh, folks that just want to chat. You know, they just think they have a deal. A lot of elderly folks just want someone to come hang out. Uh, but, but there's also a factor of it where people are calling fully knowing that if they do have a beetle on their property, that that tree is going to have to be removed and that's drastically going to change their landscape. So to me, that shows that these people really do care and, and I would like to hope that, uh, and, and they believe really what we're, what we're working on. And, and coming from a basis of science, I feel like that, that helps build that confidence. So aside from the model within a regulated area, in uh, another effort we're making towards early detection is looking at uh, high risk sites outside of the 110 square mile area. So these are uh, calculated through factors such as, um, they've all done work or have some relation to doing work within the regulated area uh, in ALB quarantine zone. And they either store wood, have conducted tree work, store their vehicles there, um, or have commuted through with their sales of firewood and whatnot. And also another factor that compounds into that is how frequently they're in there. Um, and uh, this also came out of a, uh, a realization that, uh, and I'll use New York as an example, well, it is the example, where they've, they've been going for so many years, they've been closer to eradication a few years back, it was found that right outside the regulated area, right outside the, zone, the area where they were processing the wood, there was heavily infested trees that had been infested for years because, you know, it just wasn't practice, common practice to go outside this area and search out further. So that's what I want to try to avoid. That's what we want to try to avoid in Massachusetts. And this isn't something that we're going to continually go back and check all these spots. That's just not possible. But you make a visit, you take a look at the trees to make sure that these, these areas weren't also infested at the same introductory, introduction time uh, as the Worcester infestation was found. And in addition to that, another early detection mechanism that we've been using as uh, proven uh, to be helpful is... Uh, and that should say 2017 trap locations, my apologies. Uh, the, the pheromone traps, um, they, now we have 600 laid out, and while they haven't captured a, a ton of beetles, they have captured a, a handful, and that has led us to areas that we would normally, uh, during delimitation, wouldn't have been to in a matter of years. So it did cue us in on those, and I still have faith that they, uh, they do assist in early detection. And a couple of other things that we've been looking at. Um, and I know it's a stretch as far as early detection, but UAS uh, devices. Uh, the agency recently has been testing these to see uh, if it's applicable to different programs such as sterile release or even surveying ships for Asian gypsy moth when they're coming in. But with us, uh, the advantage is... Uh, well, we're always dealing with limited resources and limited funding, and it's, and it's not like it's going to be ever increasing, and we have all these expectations to do the same amount of work. So what we have currently is a practice of when a suspicious tree is found, we have our staff look at it with binoculars, we have them look at it with spotting scopes. If they cannot make a decision, they have to call in our limited climbing staff. That takes them off that, 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 that buffer survey, and it takes a whole day out of their work sometimes to survey one tree. The hope is that in using a UAS, the staff can go up there, get a definitive picture, uh, thus allowing the climbers to continue doing their work, thus detecting those trees on, on a much quicker basis. Also, we have uh, hundreds of trees in the regulated area that are high risk because something looks suspicious in them, but we cannot see for sure what it is. The property owner is not on board with removing that tree just for risk alone. It cannot be climbed due to that proximity to power lines or structural integrity. So what we're left with doing is just checking it on a yearly basis. And uh, unfortunately, we've, we've, we've done that, and uh, we've seen that it has been a seed tree for other infestations close by once it actually made itself visible. And that's just some of the capability of the current models that we're looking at. A bit of overkill, I think, to, to zoom in on uh, the, the bowl of a tree, but uh, still pretty cool, so I include the picture. And... Then another one is uh, the use of detector dogs. So traditionally used in our ports to look at uh, 
agricultural uh, plants and pests of concern, detecting those. There's been a practice over the last several years to see how they can adapt to uh, spe specifically um, different, different PPQ programs, plant protection and quarantine. Um, they've proven successful in coconut rhinoceros beetle and detecting those. And back in 2011, 2012, they were able to detect frass uh, of ALB in certain containers in, in a warehouse setting. They even went out into the woods and they would, and we knew there was infested trees out there and they were able to sit and say, yes, there are infested trees here. But back in 2011, 2012, we knew there was infested trees everywhere. That was an advantageous. You bring me out to a hundred acre woodlot and the dog tells me there's beetles there. It's, all right, great, because we know that too. Now, uh, if you could, if I could take uh, 10 different areas that have historically had infested trees, and we know we have to get to them sooner than later, and you can bring these canines out there, and they can tell me that uh, possibly that two or three of these have presence of ALB while the others do not, that'll save us a considerable, about, a considerable amount of time and allow us to get in there uh, much quicker and thus removing those trees and hopefully avoiding those acreage removals that we've had during the past. And, uh, you know, I would love to have Dr. Talbot Trotter here because he's the man who programmed much of this, uh, along with a few of the other folks out of my office, but uh, he is on detail, so I just wanted to throw a special thanks out to him. And uh, questions? <laughs>